Hello students. In the last class, I explained how the species are getting extincted and what is the importance of species. And today, I am going to explain about need of biodiversity conservation. In that, there are three reasons for which we need to conserve the biodiversity. The first reason is narrow utility. The narrow utility, it includes biodiversity we are using it as a source of food medicine pharmaceutical drugs fiber rubber and timber the biodiversity used in modern agriculture in three ways as the source of new crops as the source of material for breeding improved varieties as the source of new biodegradable pesticides so these are the three ways by which we are using the biodiversity in modern agriculture actually there are many species that are there on this earth planet of plants but this many species may we are using only 20 plant species as cultivated to produce the food for 85 percent is of the world population that means there are millions and millions of population of plants are there on the earth planet but out of that millions of population we are using only 20 plant species to feed 85 percent of the world population what are they just you you use your minimum like uh, basic understanding what usually will take in our food and that gives the answer usually in our food we are going to take rice and wheat and that means roti and uh, some sabji that means maximum of our food it depends upon roti and chawal that means wheat and rice so and apart from that some corn so these are the three varieties of of the complete world 85 percent of the world it is depending upon only these three varieties and both these three are the carbohydrate yielding plants okay whereas genes of wild species are used to get new properties like disease resistance and high yielding that means we are producing new new varieties of rice new varieties of wheat new varieties of corn but all these new varieties are the outputs of the wild species hope you know what is the meaning of wild species wild species they are the species which grow in their own uh, originated area that means plants now we started doing agriculture but earlier there is no concept of agriculture in early man's day they used to grow randomly in their natural habitats so now wild species means the plants which grow in their natural habitats without any care then that is called as wild species and all these plants slowly we understood what is the importance of that particular variety and then that wild variety we took after knowing the importance of it and then we are growing in terms of large scale agriculture so wild species are the actual sources for all these uh, cultivating plants right now whatever the cultivating plants we are seeing earlier these are all wild varieties and some varieties are developed by the cross breeding between wild varieties hope you understood so the genes of wild species are used to get new properties like a disease resistance and also high yielding capacity because that wild species it is not taken care of any person am i correct or not because they are living in their natural habitat are you putting any water to this neem plant you well take care of a wheat plant but you never take care of any this neem plant because neem plant is a wild variety you don't need any special attention now earlier all these plants actually they are wild varieties that means they have innate capacity to resist the natural calamities and they have innate capacity to produce high yield and disease resistance that means now we developed a new variety now when we are developing new variety this new variety also should have the same qualities of wild varieties so we need that source you know what is that source genes are the sources of the characters that's why we are including we are introducing the genes of wild varieties into the actual cultivating crops right now 
hope you understood for that i brought one example also the example is rice grown in asia is protected from four main diseases by gene received from single wild rice species and that single wild rice species is varisa nivara varisa nivara this varisa nivara it is a wild variety of rice and the gene which is taken from this varisa nivara it is introduced into the cultivated that means the recently developed rice varieties so that they rectified four main diseases so that means the actual source of the genes is nothing but wild varieties hope you understood now the next use of narrow utility is uh, uh, drugs and medicines about 25 percent of the drugs are derived from 120 species of plants in that i have taken at least i need to explain two three examples that's why i brought three examples let us take morphine is an example which is taken from pepaver uh, 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 genus whereas quinine it is taken from cinchona genus whereas a taxol it is derived it is taken from the bark of the tree of taxus genus so these all the parts of the plants they are utilized for the drug extraction for the medicine extraction whereas botanochemicals that means plant chemicals used in the preparation of synthetic products they are called as botanochemicals and these all are the uses of the biodiversity in terms of food medicine pharmaceutical drugs fibers rubber and timber hope you understood the first utilizing the first use of the biodiversity now the second one is now the second one is broad utility and this broad utility it is also called as ecosystem services students hope you remember this we already discussed in the ecosystem last topic of the ecosystem we already discussed it i can say it, it is a kind of recap i am taking now diversity is essential for the maintenance of the ecosystem diversity means the richness of the species that means ecosystem you have to call it as rich if it consisting of number of species less number of species less stable ecosystem more number of species then it is more stable and more productive ecosystem if i am correct in the last lecture also i explained this point so more the diversity then the more the stability of that ecosystem so diversity is very important so diversity is essential for the maintenance of ecosystem and even individual species also because one individual species it wanted to live in a, a proper ecosystem means it should have so many facilities and that facilities must be provided by multiple number of species that's why diversity is essential for the maintenance of the ecosystem or even a single individual species also then what are the services we are getting that means an uh, an individual species it is getting from ecosystem let us see the first utility or the first ecosystem service is gaseous exchange because we are the organisms we are the animals we will take oxygen and release carbon dioxide now already many times i told you carbon dioxide is actually a greenhouse gas it has a tendency to absorb the sun of uh, absorb the heat from the sunlight and it slowly slowly increases the temperature of the earth's planet which results in global warming that is the reason why how much ever the carbon dioxide it is released by us it need to be taken by the plants so that the carbon dioxide uh, percentage in this earth planet it will be stable otherwise the carbon dioxide it gets accumulated more and more so that earth planet it becomes heated more and more which results in global warming and global warming causes say we will get disturbances in the seasonal variations and melting of the ice uh, 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 this ice lands of uh, polar regions this many adverse effects are there in global warming that's why this plants they utilize carbon dioxide and again they releases 
the oxygen see did you notice one point while i'm teaching it's a cyclic process we are taking oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide now plant it is taking carbon dioxide and it is releasing oxygen so it is a cycle and that cycle it is established or it is offered by the ecosystem and especially whenever we take the name of gases exchange of an ecosystem we have to take the name amazon forest amazon forest it is considered as lungs of the earth planet why 20 percent is of total oxygen of the earth's atmosphere it is given by amazon forest only by the vital mechanism called photosynthesis so amazon forest it is producing 20 percent of the total oxygen of this earth planet that's why it is called as lungs of the earth i think you understood now and provides pollination by bees and also these birds bats ants etc and some climatic control by the forest and also oceanic ecosystems that means hydrological cycles that means when the sun it gets heated up it uh, makes the water to convert it into vapor and that vapor it becomes being light in its weight it rises to the sky and again forms the clouds and uh, when the clouds they become cool down and again they come down in form of the rain water that means this hydrological cycle it is established in this ecosystem and the next one is natural pest control and the next one is protection of the soil and the next one is a conservation and purification of water and nutrient cycling so these are the important services given by the ecosystem and that comes under broad utility this is a second use for which we need to conserve the biodiversity now the third reason also third use also we need to see ethical ethical benefits are also there because plants and animals are the symbol of our culture our, our india's culture not only india any part of the country it is having its own culture and that culture it is uh, it it is like it is represented by some plants and some animals and you know there are certain areas in which plants are also worshipped and even animals are also worshipped and uh, it is our moral duty it's like our basic duty that we need to uh, save all these plants and animals and we need to give to our future generations and it is actually our responsibility and as i already just now maybe two minutes back i mentioned in our India, there is a culture of worshipping even plants also. Let us take some examples. Osimum. Osimum means actually Tulsi. Whereas Ficus and also uh, Prosophis. And these all plants we actually worship. And every day morning we will pray. We will, we will uh, offer our puja to this particular uh, species. And uh, animals like elephant and also snakes are also worshipped. And snake worship it is there uh, from so, so long. That means our India it is having lot many beliefs that we need to uh, protect these particular plants and also animals. And we consider them as our gods. And then we will save them and we will give to, we have to give to the future generations. Then only the future generations will be safe. Otherwise, the future generations will be deprived of oxygen and also even food also and even shelter also. And the earth, it becomes too much hot so that the climatic variations won't be uh, proper. That is the reason why not only we should think about our own life and we should think about our future generations also so these are the three uses for which we need to uh, take care of the biodiversity hope you understood the reason number one is narrow utility reason number two is a broad utility which is also called as ecosystem service and the third one is ethical uh, what you call benefits of the biodiversity because of these three benefits we need to uh, control or we need to preserve this particular biodiversity and this uh, control this uh, this uh, careful 
precautions to uh, to take care of this particular biodiversity it keeps you safe and also the future generations also safe hope you got my point now we will take the next topic that is biodiversity hot spots and it is a a proven fact it is a clear seen fact that biodiversity is not uniform all over the earth planet it changes according to the place to place for example you take a desert area let us go to rajasthan and let us go to some uh, what do you call uh, some uh, what do you call uh, chennai in that chennai may you can be able to see moderate climatic conditions whereas if you take rajasthan it is having extreme hot climatic condition so that there the vegetation including that means flora and also fauna they are very very less man but if you take chennai or mumbai as an example like it it is like moderate climatic conditions will be there that's why you can be able to see more vegetation in terms of both flora and also fauna that means it all by this example you can clearly understand flora and fauna that means vegetation it is not uniform throughout the earth planet that's why i mentioned biodiversity is not uniform across the geographical area and if you take india alone india it it contributes 2.4 percentage of the land area of this world and contribute 8.1 percentage of the species that means if you take world species is of 100 percent in that 8.1 percentage it is contributed by india alone so that is a greatness of india that is a reason why india it is eighth mega diversity country out of 12 mega diversity countries and there are actually 12 mega diversity countries are there in that our place is eighth so we 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 occupy eighth place of mega diversity zones now there is one very famous scientist his name is norman mayer this norman mayer he gave the concept of biodiversity hotspots in the year 1998 he gave priority to in situ conservation what is the meaning of in situ conservation now you have taken the area in that area there are many species are there now you are taking care of that particular species in the same given area then that is called as in situ conservation no you, let us take the other word that is ex situ the ex situ means now you found some plant in one area which is actually native of that particular area now what you do you will take that plant to your place and then you are growing then you are taking care of the plant but you change the place of that particular plant that's why it is called as ex situ hope you understood in situ means where the plant it is growing uh, it is a native of there only you are taking care then that is called as in situ no you are changing the what you call uh, uh, the actual place of that particular plant or animal and you are taking them somewhere and then you are properly taking care of then that is called as ex situ conservation whereas biodiversity hot spots it give more priority to be frank not more priority the complete priority to uh, towards this in situ conservation that means within the place only we need to save them and the key criteria for determining hotspots that means you are calling uh, this area is hotspot that means it should have the two criteria what are they number of endemic species it should have native uh, species and degree of threat when these two are there then you have to consider uh, that area is the hotspot whereas 25 terrestrial hotspots are present worldwide covering 1.4 percentage of earth's area but recently the number it is increased to 34 earlier 25 terrestrial hotspots were identified but now the 25 number it is increased to 34 in that 15 tropical forests are there and 5 medit uh, mediterranean zones are there and nine islands are there and 16 tropics are there in that 20 percentage of the human population lives in this uh, area in this particular hotspot zones hope you understood now in india 
uh, out of 34 i'm talking about india now uh, earlier i talked about complete complete worldwide how many hot spots are there now in the next topic i am going to explain it in india how many hot spots are there there are three hot spots are there what are they the first one is eastern himalayan hot spot and the next one is western ghat uh, hot spot and the next one is indo burman hot spots now let us take one after one and straight questions will come uh, uh, the goom ke goom ke questions nahi aate indirect questions nahi aate from these hot spots straight questions you can be able to see in your neat exam what is the first hot spot let us go for that eastern himalayan hot spot it is one of the most richest hot spot which is extend which extends to the north eastern india to bhutan so that means the area itna vast that's why it is one of the major and also richest hot spot of the india and the temperate forests are found at altitudes of 1780 to uh, 3500 meters no need to remember this first point you need to remember just this is a, a kind of piece of information i am giving you the very important question i am telling you now eastern himalayan hot spots are the active centers of evolution and rich diversity of flowering plants this question you have to remember it because it is a very important question which hot spot is a uh, active center of evolution and rich di rich diversity of uh, flowering plants then the answer must be eastern himalayan hot spot it consisting of numerous primitive angiosperm families uh, see examples also i have given and primitive genera of plants like uh, mangolina uh, mangolia and also betula these are all most primitive genera of the plants which are located actually in the eastern himalayan hot spots see that is the greatness of this eastern himalayan hot spots rich it's a like blended like so much of vegetation you can be able to see in eastern himalayan hot spots now the next hot spot of india the, now i am talking about india hope you remember this that is western ghat hot spot it lies parallel to western coast of indian peninsula for almost 1600 kilometers it is extended to maharashtra karnataka tamil nadu and kerala that means all these particular zones are covered towards this particular western ghat regions you you just uh, remember running parallel to the western coast of indian peninsula that means whatever it is crossing na all these crossing areas you just remember then it becomes very easy and it it consisting of agastya malai hills and also silent valley and these are uh, main centers of this particular uh, uh, what i call uh, biodiversity of western ghat uh, 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 hot spots whereas the forest at low elevation that means 500 meters above uh, the, from uh, sun uh, from sea level they are mostly evergreen whereas the forest found at 500 to 1500 meters height are generally semi evergreen forests so this is uh, the richness of the uh, western ghat hot spot whereas the next one last one is indo burman and this are also rich in flowering plants reptiles amphibians and uh, butterflies and um, uh, 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 and some mammals also can be seen in this indo burman uh, what egal hot spots so these are the hot spots of india now hope you remember the hot spot concept was given by norman mayer okay now let us take biodiversity conservation that means how are we going to save this particular biodiversity we are going to see so biodiversity conservation can be uh, done in two ways the first one is in situ conservation and the second one is ex situ conservation in situ means within the same place you will take care of that particular plant or animal anything either flora or fauna but you are taking care within the same place then that is called as in situ no 
that particular area say you are taking it far and you are creating the uh, area which is exactly uh, same to its actual habitat and then you are taking care of then that is called as ex situ conservation that means you are changing the place and you are taking care of that organism then that is called ex situ you are not changing the place within the same place you are taking care of that organism then that is called as in situ conservation hope you understood again in situ conservation it includes the first one natural parks that means protective zones natural parks and sanctuaries both comes under protective areas and the next one is sacred lakes and forests and biosphere uh, reservoirs like terrestrial and also marine both both comes under uh, biosphere reservoirs like that ex situ conservation also includes zoo botanical parks and uh, arboreta and uh, uh, aquaria and other hand gene banks that means seed banks cryo preservation and also tissue culture that means in vitro cultures etc and sacred plants and even home gardens also that means hamara ghar pe we made we make some garden and that also comes under this ex situ only now let us take one after one detailedly then and we will take we will explain what are the important points also you need not to focus on every point especially in this topic called biodiversity conservation whatever i insist more that points you please remember then the purpose will do okay now let us go for one after one in a detailed way the first one protected area first one of in situ conservation is protected area as i just now told protected area it includes national parks and also wildlife sanctuaries now first of all we will understand what is a national park and sanctuary and then we'll go for various national parks and various sanctuaries national parks are large in their occupancy like great areas like i can say kilometers and kilometers it will be given for natural parks whereas in the small protected area in the small given area if that uh, flora or fauna whatever you are taking care of then that is called as sanctuary this national parks may you will take care of both plants and also animals that means equal priority it is given to uh, both plants and also animals whereas sanctuaries may you will give more priority to the animals than the plants see this is a very important point national parks they give equal priority for saving both plants and also animals but sanctuaries may more priority for saving the animals than the plants whereas national parks are completely taken care of government no any other person uh, is allowed into it that that means uh, it is like a stricted uh, st strictly uh, under the supervision of the government whereas sanctuary is private ownership it is uh, partly it is like allowed that means of course it is taken care of government but private ownership that means i can say contracts are also given in sanctuaries and absolutely no human activities are allowed in national parks because that is a uh, safe zone given to the plants and animals and there they must be only uh, they must only present and human activities are not at all allowed strictly prohibited in the national parks but sanctuaries may up to a limit this human activities for example there usually sanctuaries may the more focus it is given to animals than plants that's why if any plant products if any uh, person wanted to collect they will take permission and they will go and collect that particular plant products that means that uh, limited human activities are like uh, can be seen in sanctuaries whereas absolutely no human activities can be seen in national parks whereas national park is a clear boundary there are certain barricades this is a government taken care of zone you should not allow that strict boundaries strict supervision is there but sanctuaries may uh, it is uh, not a strict boundary will be present of course it will be supervised but itna strict boundaries are not there to sanctuaries hunting is absolutely not allowed in national parks and of course in sanctuaries also this is a common point for both national park and also sanctuaries in both hunting is like strictly prohibited no one should go for go with the intention of hunting and if anyone go with that intention they will be imprisoned now there are about 90 national parks 
in uh, uh, that means uh, identified till 2004 obviously uh, it is increased the number it is increased now we are we we already entered into 2020 so obviously the number it increases but this is a number it is given in ncert so i am taking it and which occupies 4.7 percentage of the country's total geographical area whereas sanctuaries uh, there are 448 uh, wildlife sanctuaries are there uh, up to the data available till 2004 which occupies 3.2 percentage of the country's total geographical area so these are the differences between national park and also the sanctuary hope you understood what is a national park and sanctuary now we will take some important uh, uh, national parks. Don't get worried by seeing this slide. You need not to read all this uh, information. I, have, I wanted to give you all the information just for your basic understanding. That doesn't mean whatever the word I will give, whatever the sentence I will give, you need not to mug up and you need not to read. Every time I used to tell one standard statement, understand, then you will get the concept. If you don't understand, you never get the concept. So don't uh, 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 get worried by seeing this slide. You need not to remember all this. What you need to remember is just name of the national park and what is the main organism usually taken care of. That is the only point you please understand. For example, the first one is Kajiranga National Park of Assam. In this, what usually they never ask about elephants are there, buffaloes are there, tigers are there, they don't ask. What is a famous organism can be seen in that national park? This is a point you need to understand. Students, when I give all these names, all these names, do you think really they will come in exam? Never they will come in exam. What is important? That only you focus. And remaining, you just read it for your basic understanding, for information. In Kajiranga, national park the famous national park for one horned rhinosaurs rhinosaurs uh, one horned rhinosaurs will be there and they are best seen they are more seen in this kajiranga national park only this point you need to remember remaining so these are all organisms are also seen in this national park but more famous is this that's why if any question come from this kajiranga national park and obviously the question is this only no any other organism will be asked like that you please read all these national parks and then the famous orga organisms and that's it and remaining all you just read it and uh, you understand oh, okay this type of vegetation you can be able to see that's it and there ends the matter now let us take one more example what is that uh, sundar uh, sundar bands this is sundar bands of uh, this uh, what you call west bengal uh, this in this sundar bands you can be able to see tigers see i i mentioned it also very clearly it is a tiger reservoir that means you can be able to see more famous organism is tiger in this whereas uh, what is that uh, uh, hazari hazari bag national park and this hazari bag national park also you can be able to see tigers and uh, this uh, what you call uh, corbett national park corbett national park you know what is the specialty of corbett national park you need to remember this corbett uh, national park you know the first indian national park is nothing but corbett national park i think i mentioned but i think uh, where i mentioned i forgot but definitely i mentioned corbett national park is a first indian national park and it is very very famous for the tigers this this points you need to understand gir national park gujarat and it is best in taking care of lions so and desert national park this black buck black buck is one of the famous uh, what you call uh, uh, organism that can be seen in desert national park so like that you just remember the name of the national park and what is a famous organism taken care of and remaining just read and uh, just like for keep it like an idea okay like that these are also some other national parks just uh, uh, stop my video for like two minutes and then just go through it and then you will get a perfect idea okay now world conservation monitoring center recognized 37,000 protected areas around the world where the first uh, what call, uh, world's first national park is located in USA that is Yellowstone National Park whereas in India the first national park is just I told 
you you can see also where i uh, yes this is corbett national park see i mentioned so clearly corbett national park is a first indian national park which is present in uh, uttaranchal and the main benefits of this particular national park this protected areas are maintaining viable populations of all native species and even subspecies also even subspecies also okay maintaining the number and the distribution of communities and their habitats and preventing human caused uh, what i call uh, uh, introduction of alien species and these are the like uh, main benefits of the national parks okay uh, now let us take some important sanctuaries and uh, calado and calado it is uh, like everyone uh, the one who are uh, who all are listening to this particular video everyone know it is well famous for the siberian cranes and annamalai sanctuary it is uh, very very famous for its uh, tigers and also elephants and like that you just like stop this uh, for like two three minutes and then you just read the name and immediately you read the important species and then uh, there ends the matter don't go for all the details of this particular sanctuaries okay now oh yes these are uh, like some more sanctuaries list of some more sanctuaries okay now uh, the next one uh, biosphere reserves biosphere reserves means these are special category of protected areas of land and also the coastal environments where what is the specialty you know biosphere reserve may they are the special category of protected areas yes but in that the people that means the uh, what human beings are also part of that that means one area the equal importance given to the plants and equal importance given to the animals in that they even allow the movement of the animal uh, sorry uh, allow the movement of the uh, human beings also then that is called as a biosphere reserve i hope you understood the difference between the protective areas and also this uh, the biosphere reserves in that they are restricted to what i call uh, plants and animals uh, whereas here plants animals are there along with that the human activities are also allowed and the concept of this particular biosphere reserve was first of all launched in the year 1975 as a part of unesco in unesco man and biosphere program simply called as mab in this program the first concept first time the concept of the biosphere reserve was introduced where if you take any biosphere reserve area that means one area it is declared as this is biosphere reserve then you can be able to see three zones what are they let us take here here if you see you will understand just if you read you don't understand now this is a core zone that means the innermost zone where the human activities are not at all allowed and here you can be able to see the buffer zone that means second zone in that limited human activities are allowed whereas if you take the first one that is called as a manipulating zone which is simply called as a transition zone in that uh, you can be able to see the large uh, human activities can be seen even small small villages also can be established uh, in this particular transition zone like that one biosphere it consisting of one core zone where human activities are absolutely not allowed whereas the next one is buffer zone whereas limited uh, human activities are allowed whereas transition zone even you can see uh, the settlement that means human settlement also can be seen uh, by can by making small small villages like that you can be able to see in the transition zone so these are the three zones of the biosphere reserve very good then what are the importance uh, what is the importance of this particular biosphere reserve one very important one is conservation conservation of landscapes ecosystems and traditional resources such conservation is one of the most important uh, function of this biosphere reserve development to promote the economic development which may be culturally socially or ecologically but development is one of the key uh, factor that is taken care of in bio uh, what is biosphere reserve and of course scientific research because multiple number of species are there 
if anyone wanted to do research or monitoring or education regarding one species if you wanted to know about any other species you can go to this bio, what is biosphere reserve and you can get complete details of that particular you can make complete research on that particular species so these are the three facilities or functions provided by biosphere reserve okay now till till may 2002 there are 408 biosphere reserves are uh, uh, located in 94 countries were noticed in that in india first biosphere reserve is nilgiri see nilgiri is a first biosphere reserve it is declared in 196 1986 which includes karnataka kerala and tamil nadu there are around 13 biosphere reserves which are uh, given uh, uh, which are observed which are declared in india and the list of this particular 13 bio uh, res uh, biosphere reserves i have given here very clearly i mentioned so just stop this video for like 2 3 minutes just to go through this don't remember this is a piece of information i am giving you okay you need not to remember as i already clearly mentioned in the beginning of the video itself you need not to remember all the information i give i am giving the information for your clear understanding point to point you need to understand for that i am giving this information but usually uh, biosphere reserves may you don't get uh, much questions in your neat okay now let us take the other one okay what is that sacred forest and sacred lakes uh, india it is having lot of culture lot of tradition that's why there are certain areas which are which are considered as a sacred uh, areas especially the tribal communities they in terms of uh, for their re uh, religious sanctity or any other purposes they are taking care of that particular sacred forests or sacred lakes you know he river ganga we still we feel that it is a sacred of course we need not to feel it because it is true uh, this um, ganga is a sacred lake that means we have lot of religious attachment towards that particular lake or forest for example here uh, islands of pristine forest it is one of the sacred whereas in india there are sacred forests like karnataka maharashtra kerala like that these are all sick that means some traditional attachment some religious attachment if it is uh, bondaged then that is called as a sacred forest or sacred lakes and some examples are also i brought very clear examples just to go through it and then you will clearly understand okay now we came to the next concept that is ex situ conservation till now we read about in situ that means within the same place how you are taking care of the organisms but now i am explaining about one organism you are taking out of its natural habitat and you are creating a exactly similar habitat somewhere out and then you are keeping that organism there and you are taking care of then that is called as ex situ conservation in that germplasm banks are there hope you know what is germplasm banks the seeds of the best quality like uh, one plant is there it is a very very good plant which is having disease resistance high yielding and also uh, rapid growth all these are like the best qualities what we expected from the plants so when it is producing the seeds because it is a best quality plant you don't want to lose that particular plant that's why what you do na you will collect the uh, seeds of that particular plant and you will uh, uh, store it for the future generation in cold rooms that means uh, low temperature areas and that is called as a germplasm bank that means uh, whenever you need again you utilize that particular seeds and again you will raise the same type of plant that is called as germplasm bank hope you understood what is germplasm bank very important question you have to remember germplasm bank okay in vitro in the name itself i again need not to struggle to explain this in vitro means a uh, special conditions a uh, uh, special conditions you will create to preserve the uh, what igal uh, natural resources uh, in that cryo preservation in for example uh, one good bull very good bull is there then it's a semen it is preserved for the future generation how by collecting the semen of it and this is semen it is preserved under minus 196 degree centigrade by using liquid nitrogen or liquid ammonia so whenever you required that particular semen to fertilize a, a cow then you utilize this particular semen so this 
process of preserving under minus 196 degrees centigrade by using liquid nitrogen or liquid ammonia that process it is called as cryopreservation and even in vitro culture may even tissue culture also taking one small tissue and developing a complete plant then that is called as tissue culture and this tissue culture if we in our syllabus one detailed topic is there definitely I am going to explain that now botanical gardens in the first when you are recently came to the class is the first chapter itself I already told you botanical gardens botanical garden means this is a place where the plants is taken care of and there are more than 1500 botanical gardens and arborita are, are there on this uh, 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 in the world which is taking care of 80,000 species and even ex situ it includes even uh, what you call it, tissue cultures also and uh, seed banks also and of course zoological parks 800 professionally managed zoological parks zoos are there in that 3000 species of mammals birds reptiles and amphibians are taken care of so this is all about ex situ hope you uh, you must have if felt relaxed after seeing ex situ because you expected same like in situ in situ is very big but ex situ is not that big okay now the last topic of not only today's class this complete chapter with the, we are going to complete this chapter with this topic international efforts for conserving biodiversity how uh, what are the measures we uh, internationally uh, this uh, uh, we are taking uh, care then uh, that is called as international efforts for conserving biodiversity earth summit of rio de janeiro this Rio de Janeiro, uh, it is a Earth Summit. It happened in 1992 in Brazil. Promoted Convention of Biological Diversity, CBD, which is signed by 152 nations. That means 152 nations. They attend this particular summit and they have taken very valuable what call implementations points to uh, what I call, uh, for conserving the biodiversity and these recommendations they came into effect on 29th December 1993 whereas India also became the part of the summit in the year 1994 and in the month May what are the key objectives that was proposed by Earth Summit let us take, let us take. the first one is conservation of biological diversity and the next one is sustainable use of biodiversity and fair and equal sharing of benefits arising out of utilization of genetic resources. So these are the three key objectives uh, by which uh, 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 in which uh, this Earth Summit proposed. Okay. Whereas World Conservation Union and World Wide uh, Fund for Nature WWF and these two support a number of projects for conservation and appropriate development of bios biosphere reserves. Okay, so this uh, is about international efforts for uh, conserving biodiversity. Now let us take biodiversity conservation in india india may kaise chal rahe this is about international but india may kaise chal rahe in india is a center india is basically a center of rich biological di uh, diversity and has contributed significantly to the global diversity india is eighth country of 12 mega diversity countries of the world and india is a homeland of 167 cultivated species and 320 wild relatives of crop plants that is a greatness of india so it is a center of diversity of animal species crop plants and also uh, condiments and also bamboos brassicas and also tree cottons and india has india also represents a secondary center for domestication for animals and also plants and few examples also horse goat and tobacco plant examples and these are all the examples for this hope you understood biodiversity chapter 
this is one of the most important chapters of ecosystem so please read it very carefully and any doubt i'm i'm like available and even i'm answering also whenever you are sending doubts of course a little late i know every time i can't be on uh, on the same whatsapp line i am also having some works so whenever i'm seeing every question i'm answering so you please ask any doubt any single word also if you don't understand you can ask me i'll clarify the doubt thank you so much